Okay, so this is the second lecture on the topic of deviance. In the previous lecture, I introduced the topic of deviance. In this lecture, I wanna start getting into some of the theories. Now, remember back in chapter one, we have three theories. We have two macro large process theories, that's conflict theory and structural functionalism. And then we have one micro theory and that's small level uh, symbolic interactionism. I'm going to start with the uh, with the micro theory here, the symbolic interactionism, and there are several. So I will try to highlight what their names are. The first theory we're going to call differential association theory. So if you take that word apart, you have different associations. This is probably what your mother maybe should maybe said to you if she. Um, so another way to think about this one is words. Uh, birds of a feather flock together, right? This is the idea of peer pressure, that the associations that you have influence your behavior, your different associations, right? So we basically, we learn from the people we hang out with. If you hang out with um, kids that are people that study all the time, you're more likely to study. If you hang out with people who do drugs, you're more likely to do drugs. You know, when your mom said, I don't like you hanging out with that kid, right? That's what she was talking about. She was using differential association. The significance, and that's why I say, consider the significance, the, the significance of differential association theory, I mean, in a larger social context, is you think about things like you, we have AA or and prisons and support groups, you know, I mean, AA assumes it's built on this principle that when you come to a meeting and you hang out with other people who are trying to stay sober, you are more likely to stay sober, right? That they act as agents of socialization. That was chapter two, is socialization. I mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, that was chapter uh, anyway, chapter three, agents of socialization, or um, like why going to church, right? People who go to church who, who report higher religiosity are less likely to break the rules because theoretically the people that you go to church with are also less likely to break the rules. But what I think we sometimes forget is it's also to consider the role of like prisons, Right? We use prisons and jails as places where people are supposed to be uh, rehabilitated. But when you spend 15 years in jail and what do you have in common with your fellow inmate, maybe the crimes you committed or the ones that you got caught or things like this, these become, this becomes your, your network, right? your differential association. Now, when you leave prison, you're not supposed to have any relationships with the people who you were incarcerated with or the people that are currently incarcerated, but that was your peer group. So, you know, imagine this is your only, your only friend group you have for 15 years and now you're on the outside and who are you going to associate with now? One of the, one of the um, predictors of recidivism, which is a fancy word for breaking the law again, for breaking, for recidivizing for um, criminal activity again, is who picks you up after prison, right? So if when you walk out of jail, if you have people that you um, were engaged in criminal activity with pick you up, that increases the chances that you're gonna go back to jail. If on the other hand, when you walk out of jail, you have your friends, right? I mean, you have family, people that want you to stay, you know, on the straight and narrow, then you're less likely to go back to jail. So anyway, so that's reset, that's a differential association that the people you associate with influence your behavior. And I bet you already know that. Control theory, now these are micro levels. So these theories um, act on the interpersonal. What control theory says is that we have, it argues that we have both internal and external controls. We have internal controls, which are our own belief system and our own values and what we tell ourselves we're gonna do, right? We have our own personal guidelines for appropriate behavior. We've internalized the cultural moral standards. The external controls are the people that expect us, right? Those are the people that maybe are watching our behavior. You know, our parents, um, the law enforcement, our bosses. So the idea here is that people are more likely or less likely to break the rules or people that follow the rules are those that have both an internal compass, an internal moral compass, and people are expecting them to follow the rules. My husband likes to use this phrase that the reason you lock your car door or your house door is to keep honest people honest. 
In other words, you have this internalized notion about you don't break into somebody's car, right? But if you walk by and the dome light's on and the door is unlocked and nobody's looking, well, then maybe you'll open the door, right? So, it, or, or, or sometimes I like to ask students, like, what kind of criminal would you be if no one was watching? If you could get away with anything, right? Now we might have in our mind, oh, I don't believe you, you should kill someone. But if no one is watching and there were no consequences, maybe you would. I think there's one, I've seen one that describes what integrity is. Integrity is doing the right thing when no one is looking, right? So again, the idea is that the people that are more likely to follow the rules have both of these. They have an internal compass and people outside them are expecting them to follow the rules. Now, the key here, the key from the control theory is, is that if you want people to follow the rules, we have to connect them with other people. Or as this third um, pearl says, the emphasis is on social bonds, connections with other people. Now, back in chapter one, when we were talking about Durkheim, and Durkheim was the fellow talking about suicide, how people were more likely to commit suicide if they, or, or less likely to commit suicide if they were married and if they had jobs. And I said, pay attention to this theme, this notion of integration, the notion of connection, it's going to come up again. Here it is, right? Here's the connection. When we have connections with people, when we have relationships with people, we are less likely to break the rules. We will follow the rules when we are connected. And that's what's underneath there in the italics. So like attachments are people who, um, who you respect, right? People who care about you. Commitments, you got something that you're going to lose, right? Somebody, and it can be a dog, it can be a, a child. This is when you hear people say, you know, well, I really had to straighten things up because I had a child, right? Those are, those are connections, expectations, right? You follow the rules when you got something to lose. Involvements, something to use, some place to use your time and your own beliefs. When we take the when we take the troublemaker kid from you know, elementary school who's always getting in trouble and we give them a task and we give them a responsibility, we've emphasized commitments and attachments and they're more likely to follow the rules because that acts as an external control, right? An external mechanism, something that you're gonna lose, right? People follow the rules. People will break all kinds of rules if they got nothing to lose. Right. And, and we will override our own opinion. We will override our own values over and over again when we say, well, I don't really think, but no one is looking. Right. When no one, another example I use is um, for many, many years, I didn't used to go to Walmart. Well, I still don't go to Walmart, but I told hundreds of students over the years that I never got that I don't go to Walmart. I have this philosophical reason that I don't go to Walmart. But there were a couple occasions in the small town that I live in where I thought about going to that Walmart because I couldn't find what I needed. But I still didn't go because I might see somebody I know. So and, and then what would I be if I say one thing and I do something else? We call that a hypocrite. Hypocrite is not a compliment. Right. So I have these internal beliefs that sometimes I'm willing to override but I don't want to let other people down and be declared deviant. And that's what it means to be called a hypocrite. You are deviant. You are unpredictable. You say one thing, you do something else. We don't like that. We like predictability. Our brains are programmed for patterns and consistency. When you violate those patterns, that's confusing and makes us uncomfortable. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to stop here because I'm already at nine minutes and I'll come back and I'll talk about labeling theory, which is another micro theory.